Welcome to another video where all you're gonna get is me talking about stuff. to anything in particular rather you could think of it as something maybe inspired by a certain video that I saw from Cosmic Skeptic's YouTube channel but what I'm going to be saying in this video is largely unrelated to what he says in his video rather it's just that watching his video got me thinking on the topic of hell and I decided that hey hell is something on which I have quite a bit to say so I decided today that I was going to, you know, talk about hell and in particular talk about a particular conception of the nature of hell, of what hell is. This conception is summarized, I think, by the Catholic Church as thus, hell is a state of definitive exclusion from communion with God and the blessed. Or, if you prefer, in the more accessible words of uh, the Catholic Stephen Colbert, Hell is the absence of God's love. Now, details on the nature of hell is something that isn't decided in Christendom. The Bible itself, while noting that hell exists, is sparse on details. And much of the more popular, you know, colourful imagery that we're used to is derived from non-biblical sources. Actual theologians, I think, are generally still divided on the issue. But for my part, I find the Catholic conception to be interesting and you know, appealing and consistent with my overall views on God and His nature. The conception of hell as a self-chosen exclusion saves us from having to postulate a realm or a place in which hell is located. It also puts a you know, favourable spin on the classic question of does it make sense for a loving God to be sending people to hell? The idea here is that God is love and makes His love freely available to all. Hell is simply what happens to the people who fully reject this love with their own free will. So rather than having you know, reluctant people placed into a place called hell against the will, in this conception, hell is in fact, a direct consequence of free will. My favourite author, C.S. Lewis, describes it in his signature fluid prose thus. I willingly believe that the damned are, in one sense, successful, rebels to the end, that the doors of hell are locked on the inside. They enjoy forever the horrible freedom that they have demanded and are therefore self-enslaved just as the blessed, forever submitting to obedience, become through all eternity more and more free. In the long run, the answer to all those who object to the doctrine of hell is itself a question. What are you asking God to do? To wipe out their past sins at all costs? To give them a fresh start, smoothing every difficulty and offering every miraculous help? He has done so on Calvary. To forgive them? they will not be forgiven. To leave them alone? Alas, I am afraid that is what he does. Now, in contemplating such a view of hell, one might have a number of questions, I suppose, and, you know, so did I, so I'm going to be talking about a few of them. So, first of all, is exclusion from communion with God, or from God's love, really such a horrible thing? Because even in the Bible, we have brief descriptions, you know, of what hell is supposed to be like. The extent of suffering one is expected to endure in hell. Fire and brimstone and weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the question is, do I consider it possible that something like 
the mere exclusion from the love of God could entail such unspeakable and intolerable suffering? And actually, I think the answer to that is yes. And that has to do in part with my view of what God is. And I think this is a rather profound question that people don't ask themselves enough. What is God? In my view, part of what God is, is the source and the grounding of all that is good. And good here includes all of those things that we, we regard as humanity's higher ideals. You know, virtue, beauty, truth. The brand of theism to which I subscribe is essentially the belief that there is a unity behind all of the higher transcendent things. You know, that, that true beauty is in the long run not separable from just conduct. That peace and bliss and meaning is not separable in the long run from truth and love. God is the home and the convergence of all things that truly have value the light at the end of the world. So the absence of God must first of all entail the absence of all of these things, right? A kind of void that is without all things that are good. So no nobility, no kindness, no courage, no honor, no sublimity, no beauty in its truest senses, no order, no truth, no love, no sacrifice, and thus, no light, no hope. Furthermore, consider that the absence of these things do not merely imply an emptiness, but the burning presence of their opposites. Those who turn their backs on kindness will embrace cruelty. Those who reject honor become cowards. Those who spurn hope and surrender will find bitterness and cynicism. And those who reject love will find jealousy, resentment, and hate. To reject God's love is to be subject to all of these destructive forces, the demons and the devils that have always sought to destroy our sanity. And we can know this because we can get a taste of it right now in this life. Most of us have experienced life before as a kind of negative spiral, a kind of burning cauldron of negative emotions, you know, at some stage of our lives. Some of us are still in it, in fact. Some of us with perhaps unimaginable intensity. And I've heard people actually describe this sort of pain as a burning, like fire. And this is part of why I find this conception of hell persuasive, because most of us know something about it already. Once, you know, one has seen and tasted the kind of bitterness the kind of spiral of anger and despair that I'm talking about, then you're already halfway there. If the soul is immortal and death does not destroy us, then there is no full stop. We could really spiral in this death forever and ever if we so choose. And that would simply be hell. Now, question number two, and this I think will be related to our previous considerations as well. If hell is really a free choice, will anyone really plausibly, freely choose hell? Well, I think partly based on our considerations as well that the answer is yes. And a clue to a reason for this will come from the recognition that some of our darkest human experiences are in fact a kind of foretaste of hell itself. Now, of course I'm not referring to the situations in which terrible things are done to helpless people for example, the Jews in Auschwitz. No, I'm talking about the kinds of dark episodes in our lives that we have some degree of a hand in getting ourselves into, right? The perhaps conflicts, you know, that we embroil ourselves in because we feel wrong or we feel offended or we feel that something that is ours, that we deserve, is denied us, right? And we continue to dig in on the negative emotions because we, you know, perhaps we cannot forgive someone or we cannot let go of something or we feel that the world owes us something, that our partners, that our families or friends owe us something and we think that the world is not fair and thence we nurse this festering 
bitterness, a resentment for the world for not being the way we think it should be. That's the kind of pattern that I'm talking about. And I think that this should be something that is familiar to a greater or lesser degree to most people. Now, let me be clear. In situations like these, we are not forced into it. Not really. At least, we are not forced into adopting that dark spiral of negative emotions into, you know, endorsing or feeling or allowing ourselves the kind of anger and the kind of hatred and jealousy and viciousness that we can sink into. The Buddhists and the Stoics would know that the one thing that we truly have control over is our reactions to the things that happen to us. And so, at some point, at some level, it is us who ultimately chose the darkness in these episodes, right? Lured on by perhaps, you know, these false promises and the deceitful whispers that we could really deserve that thing that we want, that, you know, those who seem to wrong us are truly obliged to pay penance and on our terms, that fairness, you know, or what we think is fairness is our right and that whatever evil that we slowly allow ourselves to sink into, whatever evil that we slowly permit ourselves to fall, is somehow the fault of others and not ourselves. And that our self-interest, when devoid of all the real virtues that are grounded in God, can ever be worth it down. I think Jordan Peterson has had some interesting things to say on this front about how humans can and do create hell for themselves and for the people around them. So, here's the thing. We know that it is possible to choose hell because we have seen it happen. We have even done it, some of us, to a greater or lesser degree. We can do it again. The deceitful whispers are still there. And, you know, there's a kind of temptation. There's a kind of false, triumphant glow to that kind of anger and existence. Right? that is really a kind of slavery. A slavery of our own self-elevation, our self-centeredness, a slavery of not letting go. And that is why surrender is one of the quintessential Christian virtues. Surrender means, first of all, know and see for yourself what is right and true, and then give up everything, everything else, including yourself, in order to follow it. Jesus Christ said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And now, the third and final question. Why is hell eternal? Why allow torment to continue existing when probably annihilation is preferable? Surely God can, you know, destroy the damned in a kind of euthanasia if necessary. Now, this is something that I've thought about for some time as well, and I think that this is a challenge of some genuine force. But I do think that there are some things that we can say against it. Now, first of all, I think that we need to recognize that as the timeline approaches infinity, our ability to properly imagine and reason about how things would work out begins to thin out. So this is entering the realm of speculation here a little bit. Now, having said that, I do think that there is something rather in system about the sort of you know preferential immortality that this entails that some Christians actually do believe in by the way uh, where righteous souls have their immortality intact but the condemned ones just have theirs conveniently retracted now still I think it is possible to argue against this by noting that mercy and compassion should take priority over consistency that is right, I believe. So one needs to dig deeper, I think. And I think it comes down to the realization that at some level, mercy must exist in tension with justice, just as it did with the atonement of Christ. I think to believe in Christ and the atonement is to believe that sin has cosmic significance and that it cannot just be, you know, written out of the ledger book, so to speak, with no consequences. Just punishment has 
a genuine retributive component in it. So one might argue along these lines that it would offend against divine justice that those who continue to sin would at some point just cease to be held accountable and just vanish out of existence conveniently. Along a separate thread, I think, one can also argue that it offends against the sovereignty of our free will because then it is not a real choice anymore because those who choose one branch, that is, those who choose to accept God's love, would get the consequence of what they chose. But those who chose the other branch, again, would just be conveniently, you know, wiped out, wiped away. So the choice in that case would simply not be real in the first place. And so we can argue that this offense against free will, because then we did not have a free choice in the first place. We did not have control over our destiny in that sense. Finally, if C.S. Lewis is right in his depiction of hell as a place or state that you must continuously choose to remain in, and from which anyone may, in a moment's notice, escape, if they are able to freely choose to give up the things which keep them there, then the eternity of hell is also an endless chance for the souls trapped within. Hell remains hell so long as you cannot bring yourself to leave, but the potential eternity of your suffering within it also entails an infinite time limit for repentance. Alright, thank you for watching. Hopefully that was somewhat interesting. This was actually a lot more difficult than I expected it to be just because of how difficult it was to organize all of the thoughts I had on the subject just swirling around my brain. Now this by no means represents my full views on the subject, but I think it's a decent start and who knows, we may encounter topics in the future that will be related to this and then I'll be able to come in and fill in some more blanks. But for the time being, this is it for this time. Hopefully that was uh, somewhat enjoyable. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.